Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Welcome to a special Europe friendly uh, live stream that I'm doing. Uh, a lot of people have asked if I can uh, do one at a time that's uh, slightly more convenient for people on this side of the Atlantic. So uh, I thought I'll try a few different times, uh, but uh, let's start with this one, see, one, see how it goes. Uh, so we're going to do a straightforward q a session this time just it's just me got no guests on uh, so it's just me answering your questions i've got a whole load of them already from my patrons uh, obviously i will uh, as i always do prioritize patrons questions and any super chats if they come up uh, and i've also got a few from facebook uh, that i shall uh, go through if Incidentally, if you want to find me on Facebook, I just go and search for In Deep Geek. I'm there, I'm on Twitter, and I'm on Instagram as well. Uh, so uh, let's get uh, straight. Oh, actually, I should probably just say this isn't instead of the Thursday live stream. I'll still be doing the normal Thursday live streams every Thursday, uh, 11 p.m. British time. That's 6 p.m. Eastern time. So they're still going ahead, and I've got some great guests lined up for the next couple of weeks that I think you're going to really like. So, uh, so that's coming up uh, on Thursday. And the video that I normally bring out on Tuesday, I've pushed to Wednesday this week. So you've got something four days in a row. We've got some uh, Indie Geek content coming up. Uh, okay, guys, uh, let's get straight into it. I've got, a, as I said, quite a few questions. Do drop some questions down there in the chat. I will get through as many as I possibly can. Uh, but I'm definitely going to be uh, starting off with these ones uh, that we've got here from my patrons. And the first one I want to pick up from is Brennan Barnes, who I can see is out there in the chat room. Uh, hi, Brennan. Uh, good to see you. This was a question that was actually asked in the last live stream, and uh, I didn't have an answer off the top of my head. It's uh, I, I'm, hopefully this comes across as relatively seamless, but it actually takes a reasonable amount of work to keep an eye on everything that's going on there and keep talking. So uh, sometimes the brain just goes a little bit blank. But I had a bit of a think about it, and I was just going to answer this one now. And the question was, what is with the one green candle? Now, this is a reference to the Citadel, where they have uh, four glass candles. Three of them are black like we normally expect obsidian dragon glass to be and one of them is green and they're used in the the initial kind of um initiation rites to become a maester and the whole idea is that you you can't light them you try to light them but you can't uh, but the question is is there any significance of one of these four being green now the reason why I couldn't quite answer at the time was that I had in the back of my mind that there is some reference out there to green dragon glass, and I finally remember what it was. And it was from in the books when Sam has come back down from north of the wall and he's been talking about the importance of dragon glass and how that killed one of the others. And Stannis pipes up and says, We've got loads of dragon glass on Dragonstone down in the mines. And he sort of reels off and he says there's dra uh, black dragon glass and then we've got some red and we've got some purple and there's some green dragon glass. So it appears that there are different colors of dragon glass. There are, and they're all reasonably natural forming. They all appear around in the same mine. Now, whether they have any different properties, we simply do not know. So in terms of the significance of it, my first reaction i have to say unless we get any other information that they are slightly different and you know if this were a sciencey based world we're talking about then yes you might sort of say they're probably different colors because they were like different pressures or they were cooling at different rates or something like that but uh, this is obviously a magical world so there might be a different significance but we haven't been told that there is it's just that dragon glass comes in different types of different colors Black is the normal, but some of them might be different. So uh, I hope that one answers that for you uh, there, Brennan. Um, Stephen Stark, thank you very much for the uh, the super chat, just to start off with saying, just in to say hi, still at work here in the USA. So uh, welcome, I should have said to anyone, if this is your first live stream, uh, watching live in the chat, uh, I, I hope you enjoy it. Um, we're Normally, I would have somebody else on just to talk through a, an issue, but this time we're just going to go through a few questions. Uh, a few questions I had from one of my patrons, Pegleg Pete, who uh, asks, uh, on the animated history and lore for season seven, they said that the Golden Company usually only take jobs where they have a huge advantage. What do you think will happen if they refuse to come and fight for Cersei in season eight? Now, I think that 
this is the the golden company in season eight of game of thrones is i think we need to forget most of the history that, that we've got that we know from the books about the golden company the the whole blackfire uh fagon aegon subplot that book lovers will know that's not there so uh we need to forget about a lot of this history that we've got going on there with the golden company so i think that the show will just use them effectively as a replacement army for Cersei to replace the one that she lost uh, in the field of fire battle and I think that as a result therefore they're not going to be refusing so I think they are definitely coming across so that's my that's my view I don't think there's any chance that they're going to refuse because they think that she won't win or something like that uh the let's have a just quick uh, check into the um uh, the chat, uh, and I just want to say thank you, by, by the way, to my moderators. I didn't tell my moderators I was doing a different time uh, this time, but uh, J.R. Rowley and Chris, uh, Chrissy of Oldstones are both there. Thank you very much. You do a wonderful job. Uh, so, and who I also think I spotted LML um, just giving me a bit of shade, saying, guess he couldn't find anyone else. Huh. Um, if I'd known you're available, LML, obviously I'd have had you on, uh, and I will definitely get you back on at a future live stream, but I just wanted to focus this one in, uh, on answering a few questions. Um, let's have a quick look, see if there's any quick questions to answer here that I can see. Uh, Tubbs1971 says, was Littlefinger at the tourney of Harrenhal? I am in a Reddit argument about this subject. Well, on the show, yes, he says he was there and he's the person who recounts the story about when all the smiles died. Uh, so uh, that's what happened in the show. In the books, we don't have a record of him being there, but I think he probably was. Uh, the Tullys appeared not to be there. We think they were probably boycotting because uh, that was when Jamie was being made a member of the Kingsguard, and Jamie should have been married off to Lysa Tully. And this was obviously why uh, we get Tywin, who was boycotting it, and I think that also Hosta Tully, who we don't hear any re uh, mention of, and Catelyn and Lysa don't appear to have been there. However, the Blackfish did seem to turn up, and we know that Littlefinger used to follow him around a lot, so I think it's quite likely that he was there. We don't have any textual evidence for that, so Tabs1971, I haven't got a golden bullet for you that you can just say he definitely was there, but I think it was likely. It was literally just down the road. He personally didn't have any problem with, uh, with, with what was going on there with Jamie Lannister and certainly his uh, the, 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 the member of the family that he would follow two places was there, so I think there's a good chance that he was. Um, uh, we had a, another super chat, thank you very much, for uh, Villanjo or Villanjo. Uh, any comments on the supposed character death leak? Um, I don't do uh, spoilers on this uh, channel, I, I'm afraid. Thank you very much for the super chat. Uh, so I have no um, no comments on that one, and, and I can honestly say that I actually don't have any comments because I haven't heard uh, a, a character death leak so my uh, only general comment about season eight and character deaths we're we're going to see a lot of characters die in season eight and i think that that's that's entirely uh, reasonable i think the characters who will survive are more likely to be the ones that in Tyrion's famous phrase are the cripples bastards and broken things those are the people who will survive this uh, the people who are more likely to die are the people who uh, were involved in the struggle for the Iron Throne. Those people are the people who are less likely to be seeing it through. So I'm afraid I can't answer that. I have no comment on that uh, because I haven't seen it and I don't, as I say, I don't uh, pay huge amounts of attention to the leaks, I have to say. Um, just quickly, quickly going back to another question from Pegleg Pete uh, on Patreon. Uh, George R. R. Martin said that John would be a firewhite if he was brought back by the Lord of Light. We have already seen a ghost baby brought to life by the Red God who killed Renly and Danny's misshapen aborted baby. Do you think John's change would affect the baby Danny is supposedly carrying? That, I think, is an excellent question. Well, first of all, we don't actually have anything that says we definitely know that she's pregnant or will have a baby so we don't know that um 
secondly, uh, could it? Yes, but John, I think when he returns in the, uh, well, firstly, I should say in the on the show, they've left the whole fire white thing well alone. They've just ignored it completely. Uh, it's not a thing that they're running with. So I don't think it's going to make any difference to the plot there whatsoever. Um, in the books, I think that John will be returned, and George R. R. Martin is very quite clear, I think, in this with his comments that Beric is foreshadowing of John's return. It won't be in the exact same way. I think, yes, Melisandre is going to be involved, but John will also warg into Ghost, and so that there's going to be an element of him surviving, his spirit and essence surviving in Ghost for a while before he's brought back. So it's not going to be the same thing that happened with Beric. It's going to be a slightly different kind of uh, reanimation, as it were. So um, I don't think that we should be looking to what happened to Beric as an exact match across to what's going to be happening to John. Um, uh, LML, uh, thank you so much for the super chat. That's really kind. Uh, saying, Robert, I do want to say I have been loving your videos around Robert's Rebellion. Loved the Howland and Ashara video. Looking forward to having you on Between Two Weirwoods to talk Tower of Joy, Rhaegar. Uh, LML, guys, I'm sure you know this is one of my favorite people in the community. Um, uh, thank you. That means a lot that you've been enjoying those videos. It's, it's, it's a series that I've been looking to do for a long time just to get down, try and clear away all of the assumptions and rubbish and everything that we've had and just come to my understanding of what the best uh the best answer is given the evidence that we've got and i'm particularly pleased you like that that hound and nashara video that that was one i wasn't entirely sure about but the more i got into it it wasn't one i was expecting to be doing i should say i didn't have the thought before i got into looking at this and then the further in i got the more i looked at the evidence the more it seemed the most logical solution and answer to what's been going on and in terms of going on between two weirwoods i am really looking forward to that well i'm going to be on this for those of you who don't know i would highly recommend you check out lml's channel he is one of the most original and innovative uh, Game of Thrones YouTubers out there does fantastic comments of content, so please do go and check him out. And Between Two Weirwoods is his open discussion forum when he has a few people on there chatting through issues. And uh, he, he asked me to come on when they're going to be doing a Tower of Joy. I'm working my way there. I said I really want to do it, but I want to get to my videos first. So I've worked out in my own mind what I think is happening. So I'm really looking forward to that. And uh, yeah, as I say, do check out uh, LML's channel. Um, but thank you for the super chat. That's really nice. Uh, and there was another one from Crone. Uh, $10 again. Thank you so much. Uh, it's just saying thank you, Robert, for all you do. Waving from uh, Pacifica, California. Uh, well, it's waving back. Uh, that's uh, that's really kind of you. Thank you. Um, let's just do... So Peg Leg Pete actually put in three questions. The third one, though, is a very simple one, a fun show question. Do you want Tyrion to ride a dragon before the end? Uh, the answer to that is yes. I don't think he will, but I do want him to because I love Tyrion. I've gone on record many times saying Tyrion is uh, my uh, favourite character, certainly in the books. Uh, in the show, um, I'm not 100% happy with what they've done with him. Uh, in the latter couple of seasons, but uh, I love the character, so yeah, I'd love him too because that is what he dreams of doing. Um, uh, I don't think he will, though, unfortunately. But this does link across to uh, Gordana Ninchevic, uh, who uh, another patron, hi Gordana, saying, um, Do you think Game of Thrones deserved this year's Emmy? And Peter Dinklage and uh, saying that uh, Beyond the Wall was some of the worst TV ever, perhaps, apart from the CGI, which I agree was excellent. Peter is an excellent actor, but the character has become a little dull lately. So, yeah, I think for me, as I said, I love the character of Tyrion. I think Peter Dinklage has done an astonishing job, so I would draw a distinction between his acting and what the character was doing in last season. Um, I think it is a testament to his acting that that scene when he's on the boat and he's just staring at John going into uh, Danny's room, people are still debating what that five seconds 
meant what was going in his mind going on in his mind and i think that is a huge testament to his acting that even without saying anything people a year a bit more than a year are still talking about it and i so i think yes he uh he did an excellent uh performance with i think less um let's see how i can say this tactfully uh not as many good lines let's put it that way and character development that he had in previous seasons so um i think he deserved it um uh, i'm a big fan of the work that he's done on on with that character uh whether or not the character was developed as well i i'm not 100 percent sure uh that i would agree that it does um uh, Villangio, Villangio uh, saying uh, thank you for your videos and hi from the US. Hi there. There's a lot of people from America. I, I did this uh, hoping that this would be a time that uh, people in uh, the UK, in Europe and, and, and people in that kind of time zone would be able to watch. But there's still a lot of people in the US, which is fantastic. Um, uh, so saying, what do you think about the theories surrounding Rob's baby in the books? Um, uh, this is a very good question. I've not looked into, I'll be honest, I've not looked into it in as much depth as I have some other things. I think it would be fascinating, the idea that he has a baby or baby on the way. Um, another Stark, I think, would be really interesting. I don't, I don't think it's likely. Again, I've not looked into it in depth, but that's my first instinct is I don't think it's likely. Uh, George R. R. Martin does like to have big and complicated uh, uh, plot lines in the books that haven't always gone across to the show. But to me, the having the, um, the ex-King of the North having a child that is then indisputably uh, going to be the inheritor, that strikes me as being such a big plot line that they would probably have had to have kept it in the show. So that's just my gut instinct there, uh, but I've not investigated that to the same extent I have a number of other things. Um, Lauren's Corner, Q&A, are you going to Con of Thrones 2019? Yes, I am. Um, uh, the What else have we got going on? Um, let's pick up another question from the my patrons cdw hi cdw uh saying i wonder about the gigantic dragon skeleton uh recaro spotted in the red waist so huge that he could ride through its jawbone do you think daenerys was able to hatch the dragon eggs also because of the very place where she was as in essos near old valeria not wessos i think that's uh an excellent uh, question my feeling is that Valyrian magic and hatching the dragon eggs is Valyrian magic of some kind is always to do with fire and blood. So the, the basic constituents that we've got is the fire, which was Carl Drogo's funeral pyre, and the blood, which is the death of, depending on which way you cut it, uh, Carl Drogo, Miri Mazdur, Rago, the the... the Danny and Drogo's child, or possibly the, the Drogo's horse. Uh, but three, the way I see it is you get three, my take is that it's not the horse, it's those three big characters. You get one clearly very powerful magic user, you get the greatest Carl uh, of, of his age, and you get the child who is Daenerys's child and the child of Carl Drogo. Those are three mega powerful deaths and a king's blood is powerful. So I think that added a huge amount of power into it. I think that Danny understood what she was doing as she was doing it. I think that the the presence of the comet overhead is also incredibly powerful. This is links across back to LML's uh, work. Uh, one of the things that he's convinced me of is the, the importance of the astronomy in all of these things and uh, meteorological events. And the comet itself brought power, brought magic, as it were. That's what the the there's lots of evidence of things coming from space like meteors, and those are what bring about magic. So I think it's the confluence of all of those things in this kind of perfect storm that allows those dragon eggs to be born. In terms of the place, yeah, perhaps there are some things uh, that geography does seem to impact on. For example, Melisandre talks about being at the wall. Her magic is a lot powerful, a lot more powerful. So I think that this is where there is magic somewhere already that 
allows more magic to be there in some way. It's it's not 100% clear, but it, it does certainly seem when the dragons are back, that sort of opens the floodgates a little bit for a bit more magic. So the pyromancers find it easier to do their work uh, over in King's Landing and things like that. So some magic helps more magic. So being closer to Valyria, perhaps, I think they're still a reasonable way away from there, quite a few hundred miles, I would suspect, maybe even thousand, thousands. So um, I I don't think it was directly that, but maybe slightly. I think that it was the fire and the blood, the sacrifices and the comet that were the things that, that did it. Um, uh, Lawrence Corner, thank you for your enthusiastic uh, response to my uh, yes, I'll be at Con of Thrones. Uh, Fraulein Winter, uh, 10 euros. Just thank you for this live stream um, uh, at a, uh, a Europe-friendly time. Appreciate it very much. And sorry for the fake money. No idea how to change the currency of the super jet. 10 euros works perfectly for me. Thank you so much. That's that, that's incredible. Incredibly generous of you, thank you. Um, uh, uh, Helena von Lundstein, uh, make gin great again. Oh, it's, now your thing has been changed to make Mordor great again, which I'm not sure I approve of as much as make gin great again. Uh, but thank you very much for your nine euros 99, some euros from Europe. My question is on Patreon. I'm too lazy to type. Uh, I did actually uh, note it down and I will happily come to that now. Uh, so we have got. Um, Lord of the Rings related question. Will we get a similar conflicted ending like the Lord of the Rings offered? George R. R. Martin said there will be similarities, question mark. Instead of a lasting peace after the final battle, it turns out there will be more wars to fight and more conflicts to settle. Also, some of the main characters never really got the peace they were after, like Frodo and Bilbo. The a Song of Ice and Fire story might also not offer a real end of the conflict. It's all a circle, isn't it? I think this is an excellent question. One, I love uh, diving into these kind of similarities between two stories that I love being uh, The Lord of the Rings and A Song of Ice and Fire. What George R. R. Martin has said is that he wants when he's asked about the ending, we all know about uh, the word that always gets bandied around, that the ending is going to be, and then there's a word beginning with B that I'm trying my best not to use because I think it is overused. Um, the thing when he's he was asked once, which I found fascinating, was he said that he wants the feel of the ending of A Song of Ice and Fire to be the same as the feel of The Scouring of the Shire, which is the penultimate chapter in the Lord of the Rings. And in that very high level, all of the big battles have happened. The hobbits return home. They are changed. As you say, Frodo is is not the, the innocent that he was. He's, uh, he's been changed by it. All of the, the hobbits have been changed. Uh, and they come back and they find, um, spoiler alert if you've not read Lord of the Rings, Saruman's there. Um, and uh, they need to get him out of the Shire. Saruman has basically enslaved all the hobbits in the Shire, and they need to get him out. So we need to... Um, uh, we've got the situation where the hobbits use the skills and things that they've learned to get out the, the, the second bad guy from the Shire, and... Uh, rebuild it and it's not going to be the same it's returned to what it was like but it's never going to be the same the characters are not the same the people are not the same the place cannot be the same that's the feel that george rr R. martin wants for the ending of a song of ice and fire he wants uh, these characters who've been changed and scarred by what has happened to come back home to face off against the the enemy in their own home, uh, not the big bad, and he wants them to use whatever they've learned to just get rid of that and then start to build again, and then to end on this feeling of everything's not perfect, everything's not wonderful, but we're rebuilding and we're moving forward. And that, I think, is the feeling that we're going to get in a song by and Fire. So at a high level, I think that once... The whole issue of the others has been dealt with. Then we get the last remaining people who uh, return back to the the Seven Kingdoms, to what they where what was there before, to King's Landing, to Winterfell, wherever, and they have to face this secondary threat, whether that's Cersei, whether that's Euron, 
I'm not 100 percent sure I'm, I'm wondering whether euron might be the the, the secondary threat uh, that needs to be got rid of and then they need to start again with hope but also they've been damaged by what has happened so that is what i think the feel of the end of it is going to be based on what george r, r. martin has said um, so I hope that one uh, answers there. More relief, thank you. That's incredibly generous. Twenty-five dollars. Thank you for all these wonderful live streams. I thoroughly enjoy your traveler's guide videos. I really enjoy. That's incredibly generous, Maura. And I, I really enjoy making the traveler's guide videos. It's, it, it's a series which has been going on now. I noticed for like, yeah. You know, three quarters of a year um and they're very rarely like the most watched videos i ever do but they're the the videos that probably i enjoy making the most because it's a chance for me to explore the world that has been created so uh, thank you very much for that i'm 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 really glad that people uh, enjoy them um it's uh it's something i love doing um so just um have a quick check through uh, another super chat tubs 1971 thank you so much five dollars saying here's some american money as well uh thank you getting money from all all, all all different kinds of money that's very kind and shadow fox with some british pounds five pounds thank you so much does Valor's antithesis god have a name and will we ever find out what it is your videos are always amazing long may continue uh thank you so much that's very kind for those kind words uh and the super chat uh now uh, so i always mispronounce relor or whatever it is uh it, in it is a dual religion with an opposite and the opposite is called the great other uh now uh, will we ever find out what it is N this i did actually a video on this quite a long time ago um so do check that out it was called i think who is the great other if you're interested in a more detailed set of thinking on that please do go and check that out the short answer is i don't think we're ever going to get a definitive answer on this which actually brings me to um uh, another one of the questions on Facebook, which was um, uh, Andrew Curzon. I will come back in just one moment, Shadow Fox, to, to this, but I just, this is on the same thing. Andrew Curzon on Facebook, who said, what do you think will be the biggest unanswered question once the series is completed? My personal view is that George R. R. Martin will leave the question of the gods and their identity open to the reader. So uh, I think I would agree that we're not going to get, and George R. R. Martin, I think, has been very clear, we are not going to get the gods work, walking the earth. We're not going to see any of this. So we just have to go by what we have learned and understood and uh, he seems very much wanting us to look not at the gods and their identity, but what the impacts of people's belief. So the impacts of Melisandre's belief in the Lord of Light are very clear. What she does and who she thinks is Azora High, she heads off and does huge things that change huge plot points because of her belief. Similarly, when we get uh, uh, Arian Grey Joy, he does huge things because of his belief uh, and, and so on. So it's, it's what he's wanting to point out is the impact on people, not the truth of what they actually believe. Um, that said, uh, my, theory is that because so much of this idea of the Lord of Light seems to be uh, up against this idea with through the idea of Azora High, I think it's likely that there is some kind of uh, memory that has been passed down from the Long Night in the past. And uh, I think therefore that the Great Other is the whatever it, that caused the the others to come the first time around now if you take that to its very literal sense then uh, certainly on show logic that means that is the children of the forest or the weirwoods or, or or the the old magic but the it is very obvious that melisandre never sees or feels the great other in any way she wonders whether people are the great others uh um when she's looking in the flames and she sees blood raven and brand she wonders whether they are the servants of the the great other um they are of course one could argue the servants of the weirwood network of the the old magic so uh, the antithesis god is has a name it's the great other 
Uh, will we ever find out what it is? No, I don't think we will. But I have my theories as they do. That I gave you the very short version, but there's a longer version in the video if you want to check it out. Let's, uh, I think I saw another super chat, uh, actually. So uh, let's quickly scroll through. And yes, there was one from uh, Unalesca Payne Miles. Uh, thank you so much. That's very kind. Uh, not a big question, not big picture question, but have you seen Gemma's video about Tywin's secret tunnel? What do you think of Tywin and Tyrion being more alike than we think? So I haven't seen Gemma's video on that. I'm sure it was excellent. Those who don't know Gemma is Secrets of the Citadel. She's got an excellent channel. Please do go, go check that out. The idea here is that there is a secret tunnel which leads uh, off uh, from the Red Keep, from the, that can be accessed from the Tower of the Hand, all the way out into King's Landing. And Varys says this was used by a former Hand of the King to go and visit his mistress. And Tyrion uh, gets access to it and uses it because he also needs to go and visit his mistress, being Shay. Now, the I, I don't know what Gemma said in that video, but the implication might was given the fact that when Tyrion found um, his father went went to kill his father, Shay was there. The implication is that perhaps yes, Tywin's uh, lofty words about um, uh, whores and the like. Um, wish I could do a better Charles Dance impression. Uh, that uh, actually that was all a show and that he was quite similar to Tyrion. Now, I think that, as far as I'm concerned, I know that there are lots of theories about whether Tyrion might be uh, a secret Targaryen. The more I look at it, the more I see the links between Tyrion and Tywin. They are so alike in the way that they think, and the way that they act, and it's the, 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 the fact that Tywin hates Tyrion is, yes, large part due to the fact that his birth led to the death of his beloved wife, part, large part because he is uh, he could not prove he, he was his child. He suspected he might have been uh, the, the, the child of Aerys, the Mad King. Yes, also because he was a figure of fun, uh, being uh, a, a dwarf, being the imp. Uh, but also, I think, because he saw a lot of himself in him. And I think that that, in Tywin's mentality, would have made him hate him. The fact that he saw somebody who was everything you did not want, but you recognised that actually there was a lot of you in them. I think that would have really screwed with his mind, and I think that would have been leading to a lot of the visceral hatred that was there that survived long after than it probably should have done. Uh, Brennan Barnes uh, says, uh, thank you very much for the super chat, uh, uh, Nicola's question about a second hammer of the waters. Uh, this I love, I say this every time this happens, because I love it when it happens. Uh, when people spot somebody else's question uh, and think it's deserving of my attention, I, I, I would love to be able to read everything that's going on in the chat, but the, uh, they move through so quickly, I quite often miss stuff. Super chats, they are highlighted and I can see them. So if somebody pops something in super chat from somebody else, I think that's incredibly generous of them. So thank you, uh, Brendan, that's, that's really kind. I will now quickly have a look for Nicola's question about uh, the hammer of the waters. Uh, so if you excuse me for just one moment when, um, uh, I just try and try and find that. <laughs> okay, so the question is, did the children of the forest use the second hammer of the waters that failed on the region now called the neck? One second. Yes, at least that's what we're told. So the hammer of the waters is... Uh, we're told the magic spell that the children of the forest used to try and stop the onward advance of humans. The first time they did it, they broke, there was a land bridge between Dawn and Essos, and the first time we're told that that, that came down and smashed the land bridge, there's now just some a few islands across there, uh, but you can't just walk across. So that was the first attempt. We're told that the second attempt was to 
uh, try and create a, uh, or split off the north of es uh, Westeros from the south at the neck, uh, and it was cast from Moat Kaelin. Now, uh, I th this is one of those things which is way back in uh, the, the, the dawn of time, and so we have to take these things with a huge pinch of salt. Personally, I think it makes sense. I don't think we can know for sure. I've heard other, uh, I think, slightly more fanciful suggestions about perhaps there was another ice wall there and that melted and that's what made it all boggy uh, there in the neck. But I think, yes, that seems the most likely solution is that, uh, that the children of the forest who did have uh, magic over the elements, they did indeed um, uh, cast it to try and hold the people back a hold of the advance of humans back at the neck. We don't know is the short answer, but it, it makes sense to me. Uh, so thank you, uh, Nicola, for the question and Brennan for picking up on it. Um, we've got Glenn Carter, $10. Thank you very much. I love your channel, Sir Robert. Thank you. That's very kind. Do you think it is possible that the wall was built to keep out wargs since it's such a dangerous ability? And who would you pick for your ultimate trial by seven? Oh, um, two-part question. Well, the first part, uh, do I think it's possible that the wall was built to keep out wargs since it is, it's such a dangerous ability? No. I think that the, the wall, you have to remember the wall is, it, it's as high as it is now. But when it was built, it wasn't that high. It was just like a normal-sized wall. I mean might have been quite a high wall but not the massive structure we have right now and then it was built on generation by generation by the night's watch until it reached the level that it's at at the moment so uh, it was supposed to be a a wall to prevent people getting through but the the most important thing appears to be the magic within the wall not the physical barrier and the magic within the wall appears to be to prevent uh, the uh, undead from crossing so that appears to be what the intention was to stop, not wargs. Now, there is, I think, an argument that um, it creates a magical barrier that means that you can't. So John has a sort of break in contact with Ghost when he's on one side of the wall and Ghost is on the other side of the wall. So I think it does create a sort of a magical barrier. But there's nothing there that, given the fact that John is a skin changer, there's nothing there that... Uh, prevents the movement of skin changes one way to the other, either in animal form or in human form that I've spotted. So I don't think that's the case. Who would I pick for my ultimate trial by seven? Oh, I think this is a really tough question. Um, I think... I think... Who shall I say? Well, I'll pick out a few people that I would love to have on my team. One, one of them is obviously Arthur Dane. I think he's uh, he's clearly there. I think in terms of uh, a brawling uh, fight, which a trial by the seven could turn into, then I would love to have Robert Baratheon on my side. I think in his heyday, he was quite the fighter, not in a joust, but in a brawl. On the similar vein, I would love to have Bronn. I would put Bronn up against lots of different people because of uh, his ability to fight dirty, and I think in a, uh, as as we saw with the uh, the what happened at the Erie, he nobody thought he'd win, but he did because he was willing to fight dirty. I would I would probably have the mountain as long as I knew the mountain was definitely on my side because he was pretty uh, hard work, and because uh, uh, we saw him up against the mountain. Oberyn Martell, perhaps. How many has that got me up to? Five, six? Let's go for one more. I think let's go with Brienne. And the reason I would go with Brienne is that you look at who she has fought. She has fought some of the finest fighters of the age, the Knight of the Flowers, who she defeated. Uh, she fought against Jamie, who was hampered at the time, but she defeated him. And she fought against the Hound, who was hampered at the time, and she defeated him. So she is, in my mind, the current undefeated fighting champion of Westeros. So I would think I would have her in there as well. Uh, so I hope that one answers that for you. That's just off the top of my head. I suspect when I stop talking, I will come up with some uh, even, uh, even better answers, probably from further back in history, actually, if I started to think about it. 
Uh, J.R. Rowley, are you doing any cosplay at Con of Thrones? I was thinking I might dress up as a YouTuber, if that's all right with you. The answer is no, I'm afraid uh, it's not. Uh, uh, at least I'm not planning on it. Uh, who knows? Maybe I can be persuaded to between now and then. Uh, but that's uh, that's certainly not. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Helena has suggested that I'll come as a British Dothraki translator. Um, yeah, great. Uh, <laughs> so that sounds a great idea. Lost of Words. Hi, Lost of Words. Uh, good to see you there. Uh, Tyrion, with a beard or without a beard? Fantastic question. In my view, definitely with the beard. I think that he looks... Um, I think he just looks better with it. I, I think that it's, uh, it gives him a, lo a lot more of a kind of a uh, grizzled look, which in Peter Dinklage has, has got uh, quite a strong face. But I think that um, the, the character of Tyrion um, isn't, it's not a pretty face in the books. And I think that having the beard covers it up in a way that actually allows the character to come through a whole lot more. Uh, so, uh, thank you uh, for that. Um, uh, oh, LML is, is in there opining thank you on the Hammer of the Waters, saying I think there would have been multiple impact locations. This is about the um, uh, the ham uh, Hammer of the Waters uh, and the possibility if, I hope I'm not misquoting you, of this being caused by uh, moon meteors or their equivalent uh, and a ton of instant flooding with melting of ice caps. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, LML has got a fantastic theory about this that I would highly recommend you look into it. Um, um, let's have a look. And he makes a good point that we've got, we don't know that they happened at separate times, which is quite... Uh, interesting. So perhaps they happened at the same time. Perhaps it was a cataclysmic event. Uh, Niels Rhein says, Drogon. I assume that that is a cosplay suggestion. Thank you so much. Uh, keep the suggestions coming in, open to any offers. I've, I'm, my default is I'm not going to, but yeah, maybe overwhelming public demand um, is, uh, is, is the way to go. Um, uh, Nicola Durakam. Question saying, Jamie would be more useful commanding an army from Winterfell instead of fighting on the battlefield. Do you agree? Uh, I'm not sure. I think that the, the, that the point of Winterfell is that it's, going to, it's a castle, so it would be good to be defending within there. So uh, I don't know how it's going to pan out in either the books or show, uh, but if Winterfell comes under attack, then actually the best thing to do is to go inside Winterfell rather than try and take on, say, the Army of the Dead out in the field. That just seems like a recipe for the disaster. The, the greatest weapons they've got are the dragons, so I would use them rather than trying to get... Uh, yeah, the Unsullied or the Dothraki or whoever uh, out there. I think Jamie uh, probably wouldn't be the best person to lead the control of Winterfell because he doesn't know Winterfell as well as some other people. So some people who do know it a lot better would probably be in a better position to command the troops because they would know how to defend it and they would know the defences better than him. So yes, uh, I think he would be a better field commander than one based uh, in on the or trying to organize the defense of Winterfell but I also think that uh, it, trying to meet the army of the dead out in the field is probably not the best strategy um costume CEO is is in the chat I just spotted um uh, uh, good to see you. um Heidi it has got a fantastic channel if you want to go check it out it's uh, she's uh, She's got a channel that looks at costume and costume design uh, for Game of Thrones, but also for, for quite a few other things. Uh, she did Westworld, I know. Uh, and if you are at all interested, not just in the, the the technicalities of how costumes work, but also what they what they say about the characters, a lot of thought goes into how do you how do you make costumes support the the, the characterization. And so, if you're interested in that kind of thing, I would highly recommend uh, going over to Costume CEO's channel. She's been on here in the past and, and was a fantastic guest as well. Uh, Carrie Nevers saying, uh, at Vanessa Anastia, this is another one where, thank you so much, where somebody's picked up a question from somewhere else. So this is on behalf of Vanessa Anasty, who wants to know how you think Shireen will die in the book. If burned, might Stannis' motivation be the outbreak of grayscale at the wall? 
I think there is a fair chance that she may indeed be burned in the book in a quite similar way and for quite similar reasons to why she was burned on the show. It was a very shocking scene, but where we have to remember that Stannis is at the moment is he's quite near to Winterfell. He's holed up in a, in a village. He clearly wants to attack it, uh, but the snows have come in and they are... I can't remember exactly how deep, 30 feet, I think, deep at Winterfell already. It's got so cold that, that all but one of the gates of Winterfell have frozen in place, frozen shut. That's how cold it is around there. He is currently with an army holed up in a village. If he does not get moving soon and get inside Winterfell, which, remember, has got those hot springs, it is one of the only places to actually have some kind of protection against a severe winter. If he does not get there, then he's going to be in serious trouble. So he needs to be doing things very quickly. And I could imagine a time when, although he's in a different place to Melisandre at the moment, Melisandre is up at the wall and he's down in that village, I could certainly imagine where something along those lines might lead him to do that or allow that to happen. So I think it will be quite similar. Um, Thinking about the outbreak of Grayscale at the Wall, um, I, I, I suspect I suspect it's more likely to be trying to gain some advantage uh, because of the cold and the the snow. He he isn't in a good position at the moment. Yes, there's a huge amount of work going on within Winterfell uh, that I think Melisandre is partly coordinating, and there's the Great Northern Conspiracy that. I haven't got time to go into right now, so there's lots of good stuff going on there as far as he's concerned, but tactically, he's not in a good place. Um, guys, keep the stuff, keep the questions coming in. Uh, I just want to take a pause, as I do uh, every time, about halfway through my uh, live streams, just to say a few things which are coming up. The first thing I want to say, actually, is that this is partly a celebration uh, live stream. I hadn't really realized that I was nearing it, but I, I woke up this morning to discover that I have hit 5 million views on this channel, which blows my mind. Five, 5 million views on Indeep Geek is astonishing. And I just wanted to say thank you. So uh, I could not have done this without the support of a huge amount of people. I, some of them are, are in the chat, uh, and I'm not going to embarrass them by naming them, but I, I think they know who they are. Uh, the, there's been support from some fantastic people that has got us where we are today. Uh, and I just wanted to say thank you for that. So, so that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is, uh, I always say this, patrons, thank you. This is um, not possible to do without your support. It's your your my key supporters. So thank you so much. Uh, what you uh, probably haven't noticed over the life of this channel is that I have managed to move from doing two videos a week up to with this one. This week will be, I think, five videos this week. I've settled into a pattern of about four, plus the well-told tale, uh, which um, uh, Keeping up that level of content uh, takes a lot of time, takes a lot of effort, uh, and uh, frankly takes me, uh, I, I need to, other people's help to do stuff, and that is only possible through what has happened with the support on Patreon. So thank you so much. Uh, it, there is a direct link between that and the content that I can produce. I'm never going to produce stuff just for the sake of it. Always want to have the standard up to a standard that I like. Uh, but I just wanted to thank you. If you are interested in supporting the channel, um, uh, all getting access to some exclusive stuff I put over there for my patrons, like my readings from the Winds of Winter, there is a link down in the description. Or have a look at patreon.com slash indeepgeek. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, I mentioned it briefly, The Well Told Tale, which is my second channel. For those of you who don't know it, it is me reading uh, the, what I consider to be the greatest science fiction, fantasy, uh, speculative fiction stories ever written. It's, um, it's long form each episode. It's averaging about 40, 45 minutes per episode. I'm committed to not having adverts in the middle of that uh, so that it doesn't interrupt the flow of the story. 
and it's one a week every Wednesday. I'm releasing uh, bit by bit all the way through, and we've just finished our first story, the first serialization, which is of the War of the Worlds. So if you're holding out until I finish the War of the Worlds before starting it, now is your time to go over and uh, go over and check that out. If you've come with me through the War of the Worlds, I'm really excited by Frankenstein, which is starting tomorrow. I can say, uh, having just been starting doing the narrating, the I knew it was a fantastic story, but I'd forgotten about the the wonder of the language. It's astonishingly good to read. It's uh, it's it's beautiful, and uh, the fact that Mary Shelley wrote it when she was eighteen is clearly a mind blowing genius. So, uh, really looking forward to that, and I think you'll enjoy it too. So uh, that's that's the notices over. I just want to say again, say thank you very much. Uh, having hit this milestone of five million, uh, uh, thank you to everyone who supported me so far. Um, Fifi Mac, uh, four euros forty nine. Last scene of the show? Question mark. Oh, that's that's a really tough one, and it's the kind of thing that the kind of question I hate because I don't think that we've got enough information for me to actually clearly say what it is. But I think the I can I can say what I think the 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 two elements of it are going to be. The first element is. Having got that uh, scouring the Shire feel that I was talking about, I think we are going to be left with this group of people who are there, the cripples, bastards, and broken things, who are then going, well, where, where now? We're going to rebuild and we're going to move forward, uh, but uh, what? What now? So I think there's going to be that kind of feel of like everything's there and then we just get the, the survivors staying working out what to do. Uh, I also think, though, there is going to be an element of the circular nature of things which is going to come out. I don't know exactly which way they're going to do it. Maybe they will, uh, having dealt with the threat of the others, maybe they will pan back having done this bit and they will show us, ah, actually, there's some more others up to the north. Maybe one day they will come back. Maybe the dragons will all die. I think that's a fair chance that the dragons will all die or be pushed back, but maybe they will go and show that there's a whole new load of dragon eggs just lying around somewhere. I think there will be something in the, the very last moments that hints that these things are just on a, a circular pattern, that, that, that what has happened before will happen again. This is very obvious in George R. R. Martin's writing of, of A Song of Ice and Fire that these things echo through time. We get characters we have in the the books and the story now who clearly echo characters that were there in the past and i think that the implication is that there will be other characters and other situations which are like that in the future so i hope that on uh, that answered it uh, uh georgia girl says uh, loved the war of the worlds thank you so much i i really enjoyed it um um da, 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 da. And Tubbs 1971 says it was all me. I watched his videos 4,999,999 times. Well, that's very kind of you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, that's uh, just having a quick look to um, Amethyst. Just going to pick a couple of quick random questions from the chat. Amethyst Empress Reborn uh, Q and A. I would love to know your thoughts about Danny having different parents. I've been reading some interesting theories of late involving Ashara Dane. Um, okay, so my theories on Ashara Dane, if you've watched the video I put out recently, I think that Ashara Dane actually is the mother of Mira, with the father being Howland, and I think that that's the kind of thing that sounds like picking together some random characters, and uh, I think that it makes sense. So I don't think uh, that it's likely that she's the mother of Danny. There is a link there that Barristan Salmi looks at her and thinks that she's got the same kind of eyes as Ashara Dane, but I think that is merely a literary device that George R. R. Martin is using to allow us to go back in his mind to Ashara Dane, because I think she's quite an important character that we're just getting little bits about. And I think also it's allowing him to, uh, think of Danny in a way of some with somebody that he he knows and so he is judge he's never the best judge of characters Elston Selmy and he is judging her based on what he thinks he knows about Ashara Dane 
One of the videos that I am really looking forward to in the series I'm doing at the moment about uh, Rhaegar, Robert and Lyanna and all that is is the video that, I don't know the exact title I'm going to give it, but it's something to do with uh, the lemon tree and the red door, what's that all about? Which for those who know, who've been around for a while, there is this uh, apparent inconsistency in Danny's background about the fact that she was told she grew up in Bravos and she's, she has these memories of this house with the red door and a, uh, a lemon tree and lemon trees don't grow in Bravos. So what on earth is going on there? I think uh, I'm really looking forward to doing that video. I think I know the answer to that now, but I just want to do a little bit more research on that. But the short answer is I think that Danny's parents are who we think Danny's parents are. Uh, I haven't yet seen any other explanation that makes more sense than what we've been told. And until I see another explanation with some evidence that makes more sense, then I think that we should just assume that what we've been told is real, because why not? There's no added extra layer that is needed to make the plot work. So I hope that one uh, helps. Um, I had a couple of uh, super chats, just want to quickly get to, then I want to go back to a couple of more questions from Facebook. Uh, Glenn Carter, hi, thank you very much for your super chat. Is there a version of the Arkenstone in the world of ice and fire? Oh, that's excellent. Um, so the Arkenstone, for those who do not know, is the, uh, the great jewel that was found in the Lonely Mountain. Uh, by uh, Thorin's grandfather, uh, who was Thror Oakenshield, and that was the, uh, it was called the Heart of the Mountain, and that was the thing which uh, drove uh, um, Thorin more than anything else, is to get hold of the Arkenstone, and, and there's a, uh, well, Bilbo eventually takes it, um, uh, but there's a, uh, it, it's a central part of the story about the idea of this Arkenstone. I do not think that there is a direct comparison, is the short answer, because The Hobbit is actually a very small story uh, and it can have some very few small points in the middle that, that you can hang stuff of, and The Arkenstone is one of them. The, a Song of Ice and Fire is way bigger, and so it does not have a central... Uh, jewel or item like that that uh, that people are always going for. If I think the idea or the feel of it is perhaps mirrored in Valyrian steel swords, that this is a thing which people go to huge lengths to try and get because it is tied up with their family pride. Tywin went to huge lengths to try and get a Valyrian steel sword for his family until he finally managed to melt down ice and turn it into two. Um, and we get uh, the ice obviously was this uh, item of great value for House Stark and all of the other families with Valyrian steel swords. It meant a huge amount to them. So I think the same feel is there that Thorin went to great lengths to uh, to get the Arkenstone, not just because it was a pretty jewel that was worth a lot of money, but because it was a, a representation of what his family's honour was and where they belonged. So I hope that one answers uh, that. I don't think it's, it's quite uh, as straightforward. Brian Price, hi, good to see you. Uh, $10, that's very kind. Lady Stoneheart, can you share your thoughts on where that storyline is headed? Well, yes, and part of me is tempted to say that I am uh, I very nearly did this one about Lady Stoneheart, actually. Um, I was thinking about, before I decided to make this one a, uh, a solo one, I was wondering about maybe getting somebody else on and chatting about Lady Stoneheart. Uh, I think I will definitely be doing that at some point very soon. Uh, where I think it is headed is that I think that a lot of show Arya's plot or some of show Arya's plot is actually taking Lady Stoneheart's plot. So the uh, the whole um, business of uh, going to the twins and taking down um, the phrase, I think that will actually end up being Lady Stoneheart doing that rather than Arya. It, the, it's interesting that that's not, that wasn't, he wasn't initially on her list. They sort of added in that and Littlefinger and all the rest of it to, to these kills, and they've turned 
Arya more into a killing machine of Stark vengeance rather than her own list, which was very limited. Yes, it had a lot of people on it that she's definitely trying to kill off, but I think that they have merged that with Lady Stoneheart. So in terms of where she's going, I think that she's going to be doing a, a, a murderous sweep across the Riverlands. I think that that is what, what's going to be happening with her character. And then at some point, she will come face to face with uh, some kind of, um, probably a Stark, I think. I, I would love the idea that she meets up with Sansa or Arya. Um, and I wonder whether or not she will sacrifice herself in the end with some last fragment of who she is will be her love of her children. And I think that that is what is going to be her. And she's not going to survive forever, Lady Stoneheart. Her role is to gain vengeance. Once she feels she has gained vengeance and once she feels that her family are safe, then her role is ended. So that is where her character arc is going, I think, in, in the books. As I say, on the show, I think a lot of that has been taken over by Aya's storyline. Um, let's quickly go back to the questions I've had. I think I've done all of them now from um, my patrons that I got beforehand from my patrons, but I'll just pick up a few I got off of Facebook. Uh, Eric Dar. Uh, says, will there be a new Stark born, or has the house essentially ended? And uh, Artemisia Gogo asks, similarly, how do you think it will end? Will there be new dynasties and houses? Uh, what do you think about houses Targaryen, Stark, and Lannister, and whether they will survive? Now, whether there's a, um, a new Stark born, I think you have to go through and do the maths on where the Starks are. I think that... Um, starting at the top, I've already talked about Rob. I don't think that he's got a surviving child. Then if you think through the other boys, I don't think Bran's going to be producing anything. I don't think Rickon will, because firstly, he's too young. Uh, and secondly, I suspect that his ending won't be exactly the same as it is in the book, in, was on the show, but it will be of a similar vein. I can't see him surviving, unfortunately. So then you get Arya, who I do not think is going to settle down and be a, a lady of Winterfell, and you get Sansa. I know I'm leaving John out of this. Uh, we'll come on to him in just one second. Sansa, I think there is a good chance that she will be the lady of Winterfell going forward. I think that she will have children. Whether it's going to be count as how Stark or whether there will be... Um, with uh, her joined with another family... I do wonder, I've said it a couple of times in passing, I do wonder whether or not this might be Tyrion. Uh, that would bring both of their uh, families together as an echo of the Wars of the Roses and the way, broadly speaking, that ended by the uh, Lancaster heir and the uh, York heir coming together to end that battle. So I do wonder whether that is going to be mirrored in there. I think uh, so there's a bit of a chance for House Stark to survive uh, but I think it has to be through Sansa. Uh, House Lannister, I can't see Jaime surviving. I can't see Cersei surviving. So I think it really is just Tyrion, who I think will survive. I think he probably will be battered and bruised even more than he is at the moment, but I think he probably will. I think that there may well be, as I say, the joining of those two houses. Then we get uh, the Targaryens, I, I know this is controversial in some quarters. I cannot see House Targaryen surviving, I, at least dragons surviving, because that then creates a king or queen, someone on the Iron Throne, and I think the Iron Throne has to go. It also creates the link across to the dragons. I think the dragons will not be surviving this either. So uh, will uh, there be uh, any descendants from Danny? I don't think there will. I think there's an outside chance, yes, that she might have a child who is there who is going to be born, uh, but I, do, I think it's far from certain. The main point is that everything is going to be swept away, and the old system, the old way of doing things is not going to be applicable anymore. It's not going to be a Game of Thrones to try and get the Iron Throne anymore. You're going to get the cripples, bastards, and broken things trying to figure out what on earth happens. And I think there will be, although, yes, we will learn about a lot of our characters and where they end up, we're not going to get the full future. 
And I think we have to brace ourselves for that. We're not going to know exactly what happens 5, 10, 20 years after this. I don't think George R. R. Martin is going to do the equivalent of the uh, the last chapter of Harry Potter, where it's, uh, and this is what happened 20 years later. That's not the way it's going to work uh, here, I think. So uh, I hope that one answers that for you. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Uh, and uh, LML, uh, uh, you really keep on putting interesting things here. You have got horny goats, and yes, that is indeed how uh, Rickon is going to die riding a horny goat. Um, uh, anime lover, uh, who do you think will die first in the season eight of the main cast? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, no. The main cast, I'm not a hundred percent sure, to be honest. I was a lot, I and I, the reason why I'm saying I'm not hundred percent, I've not actually sat down and mapped out season eight yet. I will, I did that for season seven just a bit before the season. I will probably do that again, uh, in my mind, uh, quite beforehand. I don't, uh, the, the way I see it going, I think that certainly we could see some deaths up at the north. I could see that will that will happen. It will be in the battles with the White Walkers will be some of the, 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 the fights there. I wonder whether we might see um, uh, some of the people at the wall, perhaps. So uh, maybe Beric um, or you know, I think Tormund will probably survive because they will need some... Um, uh, representation of the wildlings um, but I think uh, if I had to pick someone it would be poor unfortunate Ed uh, I think that he probably does need to go um, uh, I think that the the first place that the army of the dead will go is Castle Black and we will see that wiped out uh, and I think that Ed will not survive as the face of the Night's Watch. So if that, if that counts as being part of the main cast, uh, if it doesn't, uh, I will go with... Oh, I don't know. No, I give up. I'm not going to go. I'm going to go Ed. Sorry, I, 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 I bunked out of that one. Um, so uh, got another question here from Emily McKnight Warner. Um, uh, who says, who is Bronn's father? Always in the right place at the right time. Was he hired by Tywin to manage Tyrion? Is Bronn Tywin's secret bastard son? Now, my, um, uh, my guess is that Bronn is just a sellsword. I know that is a boring answer, but I think it would be actually um, undermining the integrity of the world that George R.R. Martin has built if everybody is secretly something else. I think that Bronn is uh, a voice and an expression of the common soldier, and I think that that is his role. I, I think that he, uh, you will find he's got a bigger role in, on the show than he does in the books. Yes, he's definitely there in the books and he has a role, but um, on the show, uh, because um, uh, the character is yeah, acted very well and brought out and is one of now the few remaining uh, sources of, of humor within the show, I think that that's why they've allowed him to uh, be, sort of grow as a character a little bit more. Um, but I think that he is just a sellsword Honestly, I think that that is his role, and I think that if he were secretly something else, that would actually disappoint me. I've seen lots of people theorizing maybe he's the last remaining heir of House Rain or something else. I can't, I can't see that that would add anything to the character. The character is who he is as a sellsword, and I think that that is what makes him great. And I think it would actually diminish him as a character if it turns out that he's not the person that we thought he was. Uh, let's quickly go into the chat. I'm going to see if there's any questions there. Uh, by the way, guys, if you've got any ideas on uh, who the first main character is, the, the question that I couldn't really come to a good answer on, the, who the first main character to die in season eight is, then please do drop them down there. Um, uh, 
Titania Blue Q&A says, do you think that Bran is in the show or the books will sacrifice his family using them like chess pieces to win the war for the dawn? Oh, that's quite a dark question. Will Bran sacrifice his family to win the war for... I think he's capable of it. I think that he probably doesn't need to, though. I think that the the plan that Blood Raven was building up uh, was for the Starks to have a role, I believe. I believe that he made sure that they got the direwolves. He certainly, I think, has been guiding John through Ghost a lot, so he doesn't want John to be there to be sacrificed. I think that there's a possibility he will be, but I don't think that that's part of the plan. I think he's there to be the hero to defend. I think that's what Blood Raven is imagining for him. And I think that the the rest of the Starks, Arya, no, I don't think that she's there to, as a sacrifice. Sansa, similarly, no, because there's there's actually no, uh, as far as the, the Night King is concerned, there's no strategic advantage to Sansa. She's just a, a, what appears to be the best administrator of Winterfell at the moment. So that's... Uh, I think Bran is capable of it. I don't think he necessarily will. Uh, Mel of Winterfell. Hi, Mel. Uh, good to see you. Uh, have you ever gone back on your prediction for season seven and checked your accuracy? Because uh, Geek did it and it was so much fun. I haven't. I was. I can remember being reasonably pleased with a couple of them. Uh, I think the one that I was happiest with was with the way that the Queen of Thorns went out. I thought that went uh, quite similarly to what i had thought i had hoped that they would also within that scene have referenced back to uh, what happened in season one when cersei was cheating on uh, jamie with lancel lannister uh, but i think they probably decided that people will have forgotten about that already so um uh, i i was hoping that they would do that and that would be her another part of her parting sh not shot not just i killed uh, Joffrey, but oh, and by the way, did you know that uh, Lancel uh, and and your sister were getting it together? I think that that would have hurt everybody within House Lannister in a way that um, just telling them that it was her who killed Joffrey, uh, it did it. But I think she could have gone to the next level with it. So maybe in the books, I don't know. Uh, in terms of my other predictions, there, I'm trying to remember where I came. If there were any that I got ridiculously wrong. Mm. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not sure that I can remember. So the answer to your question, Mel, is I haven't gone back over and had a look at them. I have a feeling that if I did, I would find that I got the broad sweep of what happened roughly right. But I got. I would have got a few of the um, the details about what was going very wrong. I certainly don't think I thought anything. Uh, thought that Tyrion would be like he was. Uh, I certainly don't think that I thought that what would happen with Littlefinger would play out as it did. Uh, I think I went a lot more with what their book characters were rather than where the show has taken them. So um, I suspect it will be quite a mixed bag, on, in all honesty. Um, uh, X Hawkey was Ed the 999th Lord Commander? Yes. Uh, he was. So the question is, is there going to be a thousandth? Um, and if so, who? Um, uh, Stephanie Peer saying, I always thought that Jamie would die in Brienne's arms. Yeah, that's, that's entirely possible. I think it's also entirely possible that he will die at the same time with Cersei. Uh, certainly in the books, they've foreshadowed it a lot less in the show. Uh, but the idea that she says a number of times and he does as well that we came into this world together we shall leave it together it, it seems to be uh, quite a, a strong theme that they will their stories end at the same time um okay let's just quickly go across to uh, I think my last question, I've got about 15 more minutes, guys, if that's okay with you. So uh, I, I've got one more question here from Facebook, and then I'll just get into the questions in the chat. Uh, this is from Sonia uh, on Facebook. Could the fell in Winterfell mean 
terrible evil or foul, uh, which is the way that Tolkien often use it? Or could it be that winter was felled? There are many uh, uses of the word fell. It's also um, mountain or hill um, uh, as a phrase in the north of England particularly. Um, so it, I think it's one of these things where it has multiple reasons. I don't think it was named just for one thing. I think it's very clear that George R. R. Martin uses names as a descriptor of what happened, the king landed at King's Landing, uh, the, there's a high garden at High Garden and so on. So I think that that there's a chance that Winterfell does have a meaning, but I think that it has several meanings. I think that uh, Winter, Winter Hill is an entirely reasonable uh, descriptor for for Winterfell as a place so so that's entirely fine uh, but I think yes you could certainly say that uh, fell as in sort of a foul beast or something I think that there is a hidden darker secret underneath Winterfell I think the fact that you've got the in fact these these videos that I did uh, a long time ago it's still actually my most watched videos about um, the weirwood tree which was there before Winterfell. That was that was the start of Winterfell, and Winterfell was built around it and under it. And I think that this is all uh, a part of and of Winterfell is the the tree. And incidentally, so you've got me going off on one. I wasn't planning on doing this, but incidentally, if you read the first couple of chapters of Game of Thrones particularly the brand chapters when he's talking about scrambling about all over the place the language used of winterfell is that of a living organism it's the 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 hot water from the springs is talked about as being like blood running around in veins around the castle there's this um walkway around the the curtain wall of winterfell uh, not a walkway a tunnel uh, that is just the right size for a small boy to clamber through and you're left with a distinct impression that this is not just something for soldiers to go through because it's entirely the wrong size and shape but it feels a lot more like say the inside of a root from a weirwood tree that we know can turn to stone uh, so the feel is of a great um, uh, slowly evolving uh, castle which is half castle half living thing and the roots which have gone deep down underneath the they do not appear to be in the crypts and so it's almost as if they're enveloping the crypts uh, and if this is all part of this one beating heart of what Winterfell is and, and that's quite and I think that the the secret, the history behind Winterfell is a very dark one. And so, yes, I think fell as in <coughs> pardon me, a terrible evil, a dark thing is indeed appropriate as well. So that's all a long winded way of saying I think Winterfell is a name which is used on a number of levels with a number of different meanings. And one of them, I think you're right, is fell as in a, a terrible dark thing. Uh, but also, I think it's fell as in a hill or a mountain. Um, uh, thank you. Just got a super chat from Jace uh, saying Tyrion's last scene in season seven. Tyrion is worried that Danny may still bear a successor with John. Tyrion is hoping for the start of democracy. Thoughts? Tyrion, I, I think this. I think it is a fascinating. I said much earlier in this live stream, I think that it's it was a great bit of acting because there was so much there that you could read into what he was thinking just with that one look. I think there is, and I think the actor has actually said this looking back, there is an element of jealousy there. I think that he does have a soft spot for Danny. I don't know the extent to which it's love, but if you look back at season six, then there's that... Um, a little speech he gives this is not in the books because obviously they they've not met yet in the books but uh, when she makes him the hand of the queen and he gives this little speech about how he's never really believed in anything but now he believes in her that feels like love that's not a uh, that's not a logical uh, thing because he knows that she's actually quite 
dangerous. A lot of the time he disagrees with her. Uh, and when I say dangerous, as in he has to, on a number of occasions, persuade her not to send dragons over and firebomb innocent civilians in King's Landing. That uh, So I think that the fact that he believes in her is about partly about love. So I think there's an element of jealousy going on there. I think there's an element of him thinking, as Hand of the Queen, that his job has suddenly got a whole lot more complicated, which frankly it is, because he will know, because he's clever, that John going back up to the north with a, a Targaryen is one thing, uh, and some dragons is one thing, and he'll have all of the northern lords to persuade about what's going on there. But if he then goes up there and actually not only has he uh, bent the knee to her, but he's also now in some sort of a relationship with her, that makes everything a whole lot more complicated to manage all of the dynamics going on in there. So I think that he realizes that. Um, he's I, I don't think that he's wedded to democracy. Uh, in fact, I think that democracy in the way that we understand it is not on the cards. I don't think one person, one vote is really what's going to be happening here. But I think he so he suggested to her a number of different options, including what they do in, up in the Night's Watch. But I don't think he meant that specifically that every single uh, farmer and fisher person would uh, would get a vote. I think that it's much more likely to be some sort of a council of elders that he would be heading towards. But he was using this as a backup because he thought she wasn't going to have children. Then he must suddenly think, oh, maybe she will. Um, uh, let's have a quick look through there. Um, have you done Gordana again? Hello. Have you made a video on Quaith's prophecy about the pale mare? the Kraken, the Lion, etc. I'd like to watch it if you have. I haven't made one specifically on that. The, the It is, at a very high level, this is telling Danny about the things that will come to her in, uh, in Marine, pretty much in order. And these, for, for those who followed uh, George R. R. Martin's Trials and Tribulations in writing, this is a lot to do with the Miranis knot, which is what he, uh, the way that he described the the big problem he had in, in writing, uh, not, not the current book, but uh, Dance with Dragons, when he's thinking about um, what order different people arrive in Marine, and uh, what is the purpose and role of Danny staying there uh, for that long time? Um, and when you break it down, what you find is that there are huge amounts of people who suddenly descend on Marine at different times. That that you have to get the iteration of people right. There's uh, there's Quentin Martell. There's Tyrion. Uh, there's Marwyn the Mage, there's uh, Victarion, there's lo lots of people all descending uh, on it at one time, and what the order in which he meets people is really important for the story. And so I think that is uh, Quaith telling her all these different things, but the, the overriding thing about Quaith is that she is trying to get Danny not to stay in Marine. She is trying to get Danny to re-embrace her Targaryen side, get back over to Westeros. That is what she is wanting uh, Danny to be doing. And so everything that she's been, she is saying to her is with that in mind to try and, part of it is to sort of build the trust in who she is and that she speaks the truth, but also is to try and get her to think again about that. Um, let's have a look at a few other uh, questions. Uh, Uber J says, if the Night King is annihilated, would there be any need for the Night's Watch? The wildlings live south of the wall now. Uh, yes, that's a very valid point. I think that the Night King being annihilated, I certainly that may well be the way that the show goes. I think that in the books, it's going to be not the answer to everything is not going to be a big war that the Night King loses. I don't think that's George R. R. Martin's style. I think that he very much wants to show that everyone dies in wars and wars are not the solution to the problems that we have. So I think that there's going to be a lot more conciliatory end uh, to the story than just a big battle. But if they are pushed back, is there a need for the Night's Watch? It depends on the terms at which they are pushed back. Uh, do they still need to be keeping an eye out? Quite 
quite possibly yes. Uh, I agree, though, that the second reason for the wild for, for the wall being the wildlings, the, that's the reason that had built up over time, that is no longer there or should no longer be there in, in the future. Let's uh, have a look at Candice Burns uh, saying, I discovered this channel a few weeks ago and have to say I love your content. Thank you so very much. And uh, because of your channel, I also found Azora Hype, LML, and Sir Hunts. I, I am really pleased about that, actually. What I like to do here on my normal Thursday live streams uh, is to introduce you to people whose content I like, who I think you will get stuff from. And so uh, I am very pleased when people come. I bring people on here and you see how good they are and you go off and, and consume their content as well. That makes me really happy because uh, this isn't a competition. These guys, these guys are my friends, and I bring them on, and I love it when they succeed as well. So uh, that that makes me very happy. Thank you. Uh, let's see. We've got uh, probably a time for one or two more questions. I will flick through. Um, uh, Amethyst Empress Reborn. Do you think Jon Snow is on borrowed time? After the Night King is dead, John's purpose is over. I think certainly in the books, and I think on the sh sorry in on the show, and I think in the books as well, uh, his purpose in life is not uh, there anymore. You saw that in season ooh, six when he's back, and he very much is saying to Melisandre, "Don't bring me back again." Uh, and he needs to be fired up by Sansa to go and reclaim Winterfell. These are the kinds of things that we um, that he is uh, having as his purpose of living. The question for me on the show is the extent to which Danny may become his reason for living. I think that he less he will. Um, particularly if he dies and gets brought back again, which is possible, I think that he'll be less and less wanting to hang around. He certainly, he's a person of great duty and honour. He gets that from Ned, who, uh, regardless of whether he's his real father, that's the person who he is most like in character. And I think that once he feels his duty has been done, yes, you're right, he doesn't necessarily want to be uh, hanging around. Uh, uh, Brian Price with uh, another super chat. Why are you so awesome? That is incredibly kind. Thank you very much. Um, uh, perhaps I've just got awesome parents. That's very kind of you. Um, uh, who else have we got? So um, do you think I'm just going to do a couple of quick questions. Uh, Miss Cherim, hi there. Uh, do you think the gods of this world are actually real and magic more of an inner power? I think that we will not find out whether the gods are real. I think that George R. R. Martin, his focus is on the belief in the gods rather than the actual gods. But in terms of whether they actually are there, my instinct is that we've not seen any evidence of it. And I know a lot of people then immediately go, ah, oh, yes, but the Lord of Light, and they, they seem to be able to do things. Uh, it's never 100% clear that that is down to uh, that God doing stuff. Everything that, that they have done, others have also done. So whether or not it's that God doing something, or whether they've just got powers to do stuff uh, other people can do very similar things so it doesn't seem to be that any particular religion has got a monopoly on the truth either um let's pick one more so uh, okay, uh, Nyanor, tinfoil. Let's end on some tinfoil. Uh, what if the Night King can't be defeated, only replaced in order to preserve the balance? Who do you think might replace him? Uh, that's a fantastic bit of tinfoil to end with. I think that there are uh, a few candidates. I think Bran is probably the biggest because the Night King clearly has got uh, mirror powers 
to Bran if you look at it. You know that uh, when Bran goes into his kind of like uh, weirwood vision thing, the Night King was in there as well. Bran can wag into and can control uh, live humans and animals. The Night King can control dead humans and animals. So, so there, there's definitely a balance going on there. And I think that it's very clear to me that the taking the show logic of the creation of the the first White Walker as being um, a human that has been turned into a white walker then that is uh, almost certainly as far as i'm concerned both a stark and a green seer and when they did the magic to create him he then became this new type of life that had a sort of a uh, an opposite set of powers to the normal green seers so that's my take on what was going on there uh, and we just had a quick um super chat uh helena um uh, six euro 66 is that mr miyagi on your wall um so if you're talking about uh that no it is not that is actually um if you excuse me Westworld, and it is uh, the uh, child Ford, who is obviously a host. Uh, I would say spoiler alert, but you would have seen that already. Uh, so the child Ford as a host, and that is a picture by the um, uh, oh Vanessa Cole. I, I, I almost forgot her name for a moment, the immensely talented Vanessa Cole, who I would uh, highly recommend you go and check out. She's, uh, uh, as well as being an incredibly talented artist, I'm sure you've probably seen her stuff on Twitter. Uh, she's also um, uh, an excellent writer and writes for uh, both Watchers on the War and Westworld Watchers. So, guys, I'm going to uh, end that one there. Uh, thank you so much for this. Um, uh, 26 Art Girl just saying, just arrived, we'll listen for the beginning. Apologies for um, uh, ending just as you arrived. Uh, but, yeah, uh, if you want to go back and watch it to, uh, from the beginning, that would be great. Guys, I think uh, I've really enjoyed this. Uh, uh, I Looking at the numbers of people here, then this time slot certainly seems to work for people on this side of the Atlantic, so I will definitely be doing something like this again. I will be back with my normal Thursday live stream. That's uh, 11 p.m. UK time, 6 p.m. Eastern time this Thursday. Uh, we'll go back to the normal uh, uh, format there. We'll pick a topic. I've got a guest on, and we'll talk our way through that. Uh, guys, as always, thank you so much to my patrons, uh, particularly as I hit that uh, 5 million views uh, landmark. If you're at all interested in supporting this channel, getting access to some exclusive content, then please do check out my Patreon page link down in the description um and uh, that's at patreon.com slash uh indie geek uh oh, another super chat comes in uh bobby catalano just saying hi thank you so much hi back to you um and uh i will uh if you're at all interested in the well-told tale then we're starting the new story coming up tomorrow which is going to be frankenstein which i'm really looking forward to guys thank you so much thank you for the super chats thank you for the excellent questions there um apologies if i didn't get to yours i covered as many as i could in the time uh, but uh, thank you so much for those and i will see you again live on thursday and there will also be a video dropping tomorrow about blood raven and the three eyed crow take care guys and i shall see you again soon